Way, Silligurke hier ähm, auf dem gratis erreichbaren äh, Minecraft-Server mit der IP 149.202.137.134. Alternativ natürlich auch die Domain sillyhuhn.com. Ähm, genau, bitte joinen. 20 Slots, immer einer frei. Wie man sieht, ist hier nur eine Person online und viel mehr Party geht hier auch nicht ab. Hm. Es gibt keine Regeln. Ihr könnt hier frei eure perversesten Fantasien ausleben. Ähm, ja, so viel zur Dauerwerbesendung ähm, und zum Intro. Let's go. Heute schauen wir uns einen Talk von dem The Linux, The Linux Foundation Channel an. Ähm, ein Video von 2019 mit dem Titel Getting Started with Node.js ähm, von Justin Röck. Reok. Rouge Wave Software. Ähm, ja, äh, die Sache mit diesem Video ist wahrscheinlich, dass es wieder eins der Videos ist, das weniger Sinn macht, mit primär Sound und weniger Video sich zu pressen und nur halb aufmerksam. Ich meine, ihr hört ja sowieso nichts und ich äh, bin hier jetzt auch nicht 100% fokussiert. Das wird wahrscheinlich so ein Step-by-Step-Tutorial sein, aber vielleicht können wir hier ein bisschen gratis passives Wissen mitnehmen. Ähm, ja, das ist natürlich immer hier unser Plan. Äh, und natürlich, äh, die Hauptidee ist, von diesem Video ist, dass ihr diesen Server hier seht und euch denkt, wow, da äh, gibt es ja nichts zu sehen, das ist einfach nur Vanilla. Ähm, cool, join ich doch mal und spiel wieder Minecraft in the old days. Ähm, genau, without further ado, let's pump the video und ähm, nicht vergessen auf den Server zu joinen. Let's go ahead and get started. Get started. Thanks everybody for showing up. I uh, hope you're uh, enjoying the um, conference so far. I hope you're not as jet lagged as I am. It's, uh, it's a bit of a journey from, uh, from the US. <coughs> so this is getting started with, uh, with Node.js and this really is a beginner uh, uh, introduction doesn't really assume that you have any existing knowledge of Node.js. Maybe a little bit of JavaScript would be helpful, uh, but we're not going to get into too much complex code. Uh, we're mostly going to kind of focus on the architecture and show sort of what it takes to get started uh, right now uh, using Node.js. So who is this nerd? Uh, I'm Justin Riach. I'm the chief architect at RogueWave Software. I focus mostly on our uh, emerging uh, open source technologies that we like to uh, focus on. Uh, as a company, we provide uh, services and support for community editions of open source packages. So we do not um, branch, we do not proprietarize, we allow you to get the software from the community and we can provide you with uh, support. Uh, in fact, this yeah, presentation nice. uh, comes out of a three-day uh, conference training that we do on Node.js. Uh, so please feel free to get in touch with me if you're at all interested in anything like that. And I promise that is the last sales pitch you will hear from me. <coughs> so what are we going to solve today? Uh, hold on. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> nobody liked the spinning wheel of doom or the spinning wheel of hope. Oh my God. So we're going to talk about how we can use presentation processing uh, to be able to return requests back to our users oh, faster. Shizzle. Uh, yeah, and Node is inherently asynchronous. And for anybody who hasn't worked in a language that is inherently asynchronous, it's it's difficult. It's going to be a bit of a shift in the way that you think uh, about the way that you're writing your code. Uh, but this really is ideal for the way that things are done now, right? We're living in a world of distributed computing. Moore's law is no longer being maintained by clock speeds, right? We're not seeing huge increases in clock speeds. We are seeing major increases in the number of cores that we can shove into a system, and we've taken that a step further and abstracted it all out, and now we're looking at microservices running in parallel, inside of containers, maybe we're spawning 5,000 replicas of a small uh, machine learning process to spin up for 20 seconds and read some data and spin back down, and when we're doing all of that work in parallel, we really need a way to distribute that code and make that code very atomic. Um, anybody who's familiar with the concept of a 12-factor app, um, probably if you're working with containers, you're starting to learn uh, some of those fundamentals. Um, Node is actually an ideal language for doing something like this because it is inherently asynchronous and it's very small and very lightweight. Uh, and it is built on industry standards and it's been vetted against thousands of production systems. It's an extremely popular language right now. So what 
else are we going to solve? Um, this is probably the more valuable part of working with Node.js. So in the past, this is what a development uh, process or team would look like, right? We'll have back-end servers. Uh, these are exposing data or services in front-end applications or front-end servers, right? And maybe we're writing these front-end apps in HTML and JavaScript and CSS, and so we have our UI developers who are familiar with JavaScript who are writing this part of the code. Meanwhile, we have another silo, right? Our back-end servers. Uh, these are our back-end APIs and back-end systems. And maybe these are getting coded in PHP or Perl or Java, right? So this should look pretty familiar for anybody who's done any type of development over the last, say, 15 years. But now we can do this. Now we can have a DevOps team only code in Node.js. We have an app farm, and our app is served up from both the back end and the front end using JavaScript, using Node.js, okay? Uh, that's an important concept here, right? So people who have been good at doing JavaScript development for a while can now be more useful at doing back-end development. We can do back-end and server-side development in JavaScript, um, which is very useful for the way that we're sort of converging our development teams these days. So this allows us to code our front-end and our back-end using a single language, okay? Which, if you think about this in terms of agile methodologies and Scrum, um, it's a lot better when we're having a scrum meeting or something like that and the technical folks in that meeting are all capable of understanding and speaking the same language. Uh, so a little bit of an overview of the language. By the way, stop me at any point if you have a question, I'll do my best. Um, it was created by a guy named Ryan Dahl in 2009 and really was just created mostly to deal with these concurrency issues that we were talking about before, right? So when we start thinking about distributed compute and parallel compute, we have to start rethinking the way that we write code. Um, we need that code to be useful when it's concurrent, right? A single JavaScript process is single-threaded by default, right? We, we have one engine, in this case the V8 Chrome engine, which is our JavaScript interpreter, and that is a single-threaded process. But as we'll see in a moment, um, Ryan Dahl sort of famously, over the weekend, um, built a layer between the V8 engine and the JavaScript interpreter. And we'll, we'll see a picture of that in a minute. Uh, but it's built on Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. So again, this is important. When Node.js does not use its own JavaScript engine, right? it uses an, an industry standard engine. But what it really does is layer uh, some tools in front of that engine that allow us to do concurrent coding. And, and if that doesn't make sense right now, don't worry, it will in a minute. We'll see a picture. Uh, it is single-threaded, asynchronous, event-driven. Uh, we can achieve vertical scale by adding additional CPU cores, uh, and there are actually conventions within the language uh, where in just a couple of lines of code you can tell Node.js to fork off a certain amount of worker processes to match the number of available processors on the server in which the code is running, so it can auto-scale to the environment. Again, very ideal for something like a container environment where we may not necessarily know the sizing of that environment. Uh, and we can use JavaScript on the browser as well as in the server, which is going to minimize this mismatch between the environments. So for instance, I can do all of my form validation in a single app, as opposed to having to do form validation on the front end and then repeat that validation again on the back end. Uh, there's a list of registered subscribers, um, which are basically just node processes, uh, and they are notified when their state changes. Okay, so you have a, a pub sub or a topic-like pattern happening between worker nodes and a master node. And that master node is able to communicate down to the worker nodes, and the worker nodes can communicate back up to the master using a topic kind of pub-sub uh, methodology. Uh, we also have NPM. Uh, this used to be called the Node Package Manager. Now you're just supposed to pretend that the node doesn't stand for node anymore because this has become a, a, a general sort of JavaScript uh, module repository, but the vast majority of these modules are for Node. Um, so anybody who's familiar with, you know, maybe pip in um, Python or CPAN in Perl or NuGet in .NET, you already know what NPM is. It's just a package manager for installing dependencies for your Node applications. Sure. Um, as a the oh my god, CPAN canon, but uh, uh, NPM. Da bin ich einfach zu jung für den Scheiß. Now that NPM is not only the fastest growing module repository and dependency repository out there, 
uh, but it's also the largest uh, compared even to things like Maven Central right here for Java, right? So any Java developers like myself who are using Maven, you're like, oh, there's a lot of modules in there. Yeah, well, NPM has you know almost four times as many at this point and continuing to grow very quickly. Um, so just sort of a general overview here, sort of pros and cons of using Node. Uh, on the good side of things, it is very lightweight with an extremely low memory footprint. Um, it is a true cross-platform environment uh, in that server and client side code can both be written in the same language as we talked about before. Uh, it is very fast. Um, it's asynchronous nature allows it to be just about as efficient as it possibly can be. Uh, it is very popular. It has lots of popularity right now. I think, I think it has sort of the same appeal that a language like Perl had in the late this, this, this shared repository of well-written dependencies, mm. uh, but it's just a little bit more advanced of a language, right? But I think that's why it's catching fire the way it is. Uh, there's already a lot of people who uh, understand JavaScript, and so to make the transition to Node, uh, it's just not that difficult. You need to learn a little bit more about the additional modules that you can use in Node and learn a little bit about NPM. Get familiar with some subjects like semantic versioning and things like that. Uh, but overall, if you've done JavaScript development, it's pretty easy to make this transition. Semantic version right, full stack web development, yeah, okay. and it's highly extensible. <laughs> now, on the bad side of things, the V8 engine does have a 1.7 memory, uh, gigabyte memory limit. Okay, um, that means that we have to have multiple V8 engines processing uh, in parallel if we want to be able to use more than 1.7 uh, gigs of memory within our application. Uh, and again, we can do that by taking advantage of those clustering functionality. Um, so this makes a vertical scaling challenge, but workarounds do exist. Module versions can get a little bit confusing. For the most part, people are conforming to semantic versioning, which does make your life easier, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, open, open source governance is not flawless. If anybody's familiar with the uh, left pad debacle from a few years ago, this was a really big deal. Uh, there was a module in Node, it was like 18 lines of code. It was a very small module. And the purpose of that module was to, install, uh, to insert spaces, left tab spaces, uh, so that you could align text. This thing was used all over the place. All right, tons and tons of apps were using this. Uh, the maintainer got angry and pulled the module off of NPM, literally breaking the internet. Uh, it's a very interesting story to read, but uh, a, a good reminder for everyone. Angry? You have to be careful about the user of the source. You have to be careful about the user of the source. I thought they had a secret for the user of the source. Uh, and definitely a learning curve for developers who maybe aren't used to dealing with a language that is inherently asynchronous. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. It really feels different when you're coding. You know, you expect your code to just execute one line, one line, one line, one line, like you're used to with a, with a synchronous language. Uh, but in this case, that's not happening at all. Uh, Node is absolutely going to skip ahead in your code and execute things further down, even if it hasn't finished the asynchronous action that it had before. Uh, we do have ways to make this a little bit easier. Uh, we have like promises and closures and things like those patterns if you're used to that. Uh, we now have a, a relatively new functionality that was introduced in ECMAScript 2016, I think, called uh, async await, which allows us to pretend that our code is a little bit more iterative. Um, but, but just again, you know, be aware that's probably the biggest challenge for people who are just coming in to JavaScript and Node.js is wrapping their heads around this, this sort of inherent asynchronous nature. Uh, here's a web-enabled Hello World app. So again, this is a this is a web enabled. We're actually creating a, a backend web server here. Okay, uh, so as opposed to just you know printing something out to the command line or whatnot, uh, we're actually spinning up a lightweight web server that's uh, called a, uh, just basically the HTTP module that, that ships with Node, um, and that HTTP module allows us to create a small HTTP server, uh, respond to certain requests, and then uh, you know push what we want to. So this is interesting, right? This is JavaScript creating a backend web server that can service requests, right? That's, that's different. JavaScript usually served up by a backend server. It's not usually the backend server, but uh, again, that, that's fundamentally what, what's different about this. Uh, very high level look at the architecture and what kind of makes this different. And so I said before uh, that, that the uh, creator of Node.js, Ryan Dahl, built this thing over the weekend. Well, if you look at the architecture here, you can kind of see how that's possible, right? Down here, this is the V8 Chrome engine. This is 
the actual JavaScript interpreter. This is not written by or maintained by the Node.js community. This is the industry standard JavaScript interpreter. But what have we done here? We have had our, we were asking our app to pass commands to the Node engine. This is proprietary to Node.js. We have some miscellaneous libraries that we might hit to access the operating system. Okay, we've just fundamentally shifted here from what we're used to with JavaScript. JavaScript's not supposed to be able to know anything about what's going on at the operating system level. It's sandbox for the browser for security purposes, right? You wouldn't want somebody able to just access or just, just run some arbitrary JavaScript code on your laptop and get them access to your operating system. Uh, but Node, of course, has to do that because it's running on the back end. So it has some special libraries specifically for accessing things about the, uh, the operating system level. Then we have this interesting thing here called libuv. Uh, libuv is a very fast uh, event loop. It's an event loop that was created in C++, specifically for Node.js. Uh, now it is, has found some use in some other applications as well. It's completely open source. But this is the magic. This is what makes Node.js so different. I'm passing commands asynchronously down into a, an event loop. That event loop is asynchronously taking actions against the engine or against the operating system and returning things back to the application. This is how I'm capable of having a distributed application that could actually spawn multiple instances of the D8 engine to allow this to, to allow the code to execute in parallel, right? So it is literally spawning off multiple Java, uh, uh, no, um, V8 processes on the server to go and service a single JavaScript action. Das ist volle Lautstärke. Stark, wie viele Hühner da rauskamen. Der Talk geht echt gut ab dafür, dass, dass ich dachte, dass der nur irgendwelche Hello Worlds in äh, Node.js schreibt. Okay, jetzt geht's aber los. Was wir 
do a super simple um, console hello world app. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like for a <laughs> ah ja. Mac Hintergrund, ich sehe schon. Erst hier einen auf Linux machen und dann. So einer ist es. To note. <laughs> Says open source, and it's a Microsoft shirt. <laughs> okay. The world's changing a little bit. Um, and uh, and VS Code is a great, great little idea. I'm Justin Rayock. I'm the chief architect uh, and, uh, at Roadwave Software. I focus mostly on our uh, emerging uh, open source technologies that we like to uh, focus on. Uh, as a company, we provide uh, services. Okay. Also. Ich weiß nicht, ob das jetzt lauter für euch, obwohl jetzt ist der Lautsprecher weiter weg von, von euch und näher bei mir. Aber es sollte lauter sein. I don't know. Schwer zu sagen. The built-in debugger works uh, flawlessly with Node.js. It's, it's really a nice experience. It just, it just works. Uh, and you do have other options, though. Go with what's familiar, and go with what's available, and is not Notepad. That's mm -hmm. um, so we've all got our preferences when it comes to IDEs, right? Maybe you're already familiar with something like Eclipse. That's fine. There's, there's Node.js tooling for Eclipse. Maybe you prefer an online uh, IDE, something that's uh, integrated already with Docker and maybe gives you a container environment. Well, you have that, too. Just want to make sure that you've met these basic criteria when you're picking this ID. IDE. You, you really want the debugger, obviously. <clears throat> you want syntax highlighting. You want it to support what's called ESLint. Uh, for those that don't know, JavaScript is not really JavaScript. The special specification is actually called ECMA script or ECMAScript, and that's where that ES comes from. So you want ESLint. And if you've ever used Lint before to clean up your code or to check your code for syntax, it's basically what it's doing. Uh, we want terminal integration, we want NPM integration, we want code completion with IntelliSense, we want a beautifier. We do want Docker integration these days. You know, it's just a lot easier to get started with, uh, with Docker. Uh, we want node modules integration, which we'll look at in a minute. And we want our source control integration. Hopefully we're using Git or something like that, and we're not just, you know, saving our, our program in a zip or something. Um, but you do have some other uh, options when you want to look at an IDE. This one is actually pretty cool, I have to say. This Cloud9 IDE. Completely online, 
Um, and so it's kind of like kind of cloudy, basically. All your, your, your code's gonna get stored up in the cloud, but it does have Git integration and all that kind of stuff. You can push all your code out to your GitHub. Um, live preview. Uh, JetBrains, if you like the IntelliJ experience, if you're a Java developer, JetBrains does produce one that's similar uh, called WebStorm or Node.js. Uh, Komodo, um, and then Node Clips, if you like Eclipse, then you can just get the Node.js plugins for Eclipse. So plenty of options here. I just really like VS Code, so we're gonna focus on that. Um, we have a bunch of VS Code extensions for Node.js when we search for it up here. You can see we've got our debug, and really just a, just a, just a bunch of stuff. And there's a whole lot of plugins for the various uh, frameworks and dependency libraries that we can use with Node. So things like Vue.js or AngularJS or React. There's a lot of tooling that's built in for that as well. I have another talk on React, which unfortunately didn't get accepted at this one, but I will be giving that talk um, at the OSS Summit in San Diego in August. <clears throat> um, start with at least no debug and the Node.js extension. Go on. Uh, take time to explore what's out there. Oh though. my gosh. Uh, in VS Code, we have a launch file that's specific to VS Code. Right? This has nothing to do with Node.js. This is telling VS Code how to launch our app, but this is essential if we want to be able to debug our app. Okay? Um, the uh, launch configuration is controlled through a JSON file called launch.json. So it launches and it basically just describes the environment. Bootstrap information for the app, if I want to set some environment variables maybe, uh, this is where I would do that. But it is essential for debugging because your app is gonna get more complex. You're gonna need some stuff set up in your environment before you can run your app, like an environment variable or whatnot. Maybe you're using OAuth and you need a client key. I don't know, you're, you're, you're gonna be storing stuff in, a, in an environment variable. Um, and it won't launch properly without that environment variable being set. So you need to tell VS Code what the environment should look like. Come on, JSON file. So let's take a quick look at the debugger. Get me a cool. Oh, ich bin off mit dem Video. Ich schaue jetzt ein Video am Laptop ohne Ton und eins am Fernseher mit Ton und der ist hinter mir. Ach egal, also mein Setup ist absolut fucked up. Aber naja, eures ist ja noch mehr, weil ihr habt gar kein Bild. Lol. Außer ich habe jetzt auch das Video nebenbei okay. abgespielt. Okay. So, <laughs> was anders keinen Sinn machen will. Start. I'm setting breakpoints just like I normally would in, in any <coughs> IDE. We'll go ahead and set two, one at the very beginning, even though it's kind of useless, and then one afterwards uh, so that we can check and introspect the contents of our variable. Okay. Uh, when you get started with Node, you're going to spend a lot of time in here, all right, in, in this debugger, because it's very easy to look at the way that the Node.js uh, object notation works. Uh, it's very easy to kind of see how functions, uh, like every object is actually treated like a function. Uh, functions are first class citizens in Node.js, so I can pass them and I can set them and, and all that. Get more into that, I have an advanced talk on this. Um, so let's just run this. <coughs> let's look ich at glaube, our launch it's very natürlich kritisch. Okay. Um, so we stopped at our first breakpoint, and we can already see that we've got some useful stuff in here, and I, that's kind of hard to see. Let me... um, so uh, I'm not going to go into the contents of all of this right now, uh, but I do kind of uh, recommend you keep poke around in here because you're going to get to learn a lot about what Node's actually doing in the background for you. But we can see that we have defined our concept. Next step is open this here. Currently undefined. So let's move to our next breakpoint. And great, we can see that our variable has actually been populated at this point. We can introspect it. Um, we can set a watch point on it. Really anything that you'd expect to be able to do uh, in a debugger we can do here. Right. So we've seen just a quick hello world that you can get started with very easily. Uh, and now we have a little preview of what we can do in terms of our developer, uh, our, our debugger uh, <coughs> in our IDE. So this is the basic life cycle of a Node app. Um, we're gonna create and clone an SCM repo, hopefully. Again, hopefully we're using source control, like good people, right? Uh, but if not, you can just create a folder. Uh, you're gonna use Git, you know, set up your ignore files and whatnot. 
You want to initialize the project. This is the best practice. I haven't done that yet. Uh, the very last demo uh, shows that. But npm init will set up um, a file called package.json that we're, we're about to see. And that's like your build file. That's where all your dependency information is housed, as well as some meta information about the app itself. Uh, npm init will set that up for you automatically. And a lot of IDE plugins and extensions will do that too. Then you just get to it, start coding, uh, commit as normal, and then build. So in our target production environment, we're gonna run this uh, npm install. That's gonna download in all of our necessary dependencies. When we see our package.json file in a minute, uh, this npm install will actually go out to the npm repository, pull all the modules down, which is effectively the build process for Node, because again, we're not compiling anything. Uh, that's, this is what the npm init kind of looks like. Uh, so you see it's gonna prompt you for some information, uh, things like a git repo, author, uh, your license, which should always be GPL free. Um, and then uh, uh, it's bias. gonna generate your uh, package.json file based on that. Just talk through all this. Uh, <laughs> Alter, diese license node. Okay. Um, so now let's turn this into a proper node application, or what we should really be calling a node module. Even large node applications are still considered a node module, right? Okay, ich glaube, es gibt keine Kühe hier. Das kann nicht sein. Dann kann ich keinen Charting Table machen. Was ist das denn jetzt für ein Floor eigentlich? Kann man das mal jemand sagen? Es just comes with your Node tooling, right? If you've installed Node, you should have the uh, NPM tooling. Ich finde eh gleich nicht mehr zurück. Should I have the script in there? I'm just going to kind of leave all this blank. But this right here is the package.json file. All right, so let's say it's okay. Yes. Let me cat it out. Then this is what we have. Now, uh, in just a minute, I'm going to kind of rush through a little bit because I want to see, I want to show you the very last part, which is uh, working with external modules in NPM. Um, but all of that dependency data is held in that package.json file, which again looks like this. Um, so our, our apps can use dependencies uh, or modules. Remember, everything in Node.js is a module technically. Um, most open source languages these days are going to have a set of modules that can be added to a project. Node is no different. Uh, you can also create your own modules, uh, whether privately or freely available. Uh, and the NBM repositories would actually provide these. And it could be used to add dependencies to a project by, again, using this npm install command. But it's not npm install blank, like doing the whole build, like we saw a second ago. Uh, this is actually installing a particular module. So let's see what that looks like. So let's add a little color to our app. Um, there's a module for Node just called colors, and it's for doing colors, uh, like, uh, like ANSI, ANSI generated color codes in the terminal. Um, you want it to be readable and even fun. And, and as you start working with more and more Node.js apps on the command line, you'll find that people actually do care about this. Like they're putting cool little UTF icons and stuff in their code and uh, putting colors in and everything. Uh, if we run npm-s save, that will actually make sure this module is saved to package.json so that when we distribute it to our production environment and we run npm install, those modules will be downloaded into our environment. So here we're just saying npm install dash dash save colors. And then in our code, we can now require the colors module, uh, and yeah. now we can use this syntax to make something nice. and underline. So let's take okay, a look at that. Okay, Leute, it's now real fast, echt and then we'll wrap it up. And here's not really flat. Okay, da hinten is good. Oh boy, I have gar kein gutes Gefühl bei der Sache. Wieso denke ich, dass alle Kühe absterben werden? Okay, wir töten mal vorsichtshalber eine Kuh. Okay. Die anderen beiden werden mal schnell gepaart. Ach, das sind vier. Ich hätte die erst paaren sollen. Okay. Ja. Oh Gott. Okay. Das wird jetzt stressig. Now what does that do? Uh, we've got our package.json file and now we have this new folder called node modules as well. And this is unsurprisingly where our modules just downloaded to. 
So if we do a quick LS in here, we can see that the colored module downloaded. And if we pick this up, it's just not a Node.js module. It's just, it's just written in Node. Um, if we look at our package.json file, we can see that we now have a dependencies section in here, and it automatically picked a version for me. Uh, and I can use semantic version and syntax here if I want to enforce some stuff. Um, and then at this point, if we run npm install, even if we don't have that not node modules for it, it's going to kein... load that module for us again. Ah, kein, uh, keine Tür dabei. Das kannst du mir nicht erzählen. Okay, die müssen jetzt da eh erstmal rein, bevor hier irgendwas weitergeht. Komm schon, Leute, bevor die Mobs kommen. Es ist gefährlich ruhig hier. Alright, so we just imported a dependency and used a module. And that actually wraps us up. So what did we learn today? We learned that you should carry your clicker with you when you leave the mobile. Node.js is a language that focuses on concurrency uh, and unified development under a single language. Uh, dependencies are assisted through the Node Package Manager, uh, which is no longer called the Node Package Manager. Uh, hey, was it the default? What? Default. A lot what? of IDEs exist. Um, uh, you can initialize your projects using npm init. You can install modules with npm install. They're built from package.json in the installer production environment. Uh, and they're included uh, in variables using the required command. But there's still a lot to learn. So uh, go learn about uh, understanding asynchronous coding. It just takes practice. Uh, get to know the events and streams inside of Node. Learn about functional programming. This is very much functional programming. Uh, master your IDs, debugger, and start exploring other modules. And finally, feel free to reach out to me. I do get lonely. And uh, you, I will promise you I will accept your LinkedIn or Twitter or any of that. I do get a little political on Twitter, though, so if you're easily offended by uh, hippie politics, then maybe don't go there. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Okay. Nice. This, um war der Talk von, von wem war der überhaupt? Justin Röck. Hä, <lacht> ähm, wo ist mein Home jetzt? Ich dachte, das wäre hier vorne direkt. Erzähl mir doch jetzt nicht, dass das nicht hier vorne ist. Ähm, ja genau, von dem The Linux Foundation Channel. Und ähm, ja, wir sind hier auf Lasergurkenland, dem gratis erreichbaren äh, Minecraft Server ähm, mit der IP 149.202.127.134 alternativ momentan erreichbar unter der Domain sillyhoon.com ähm, das ganze sieht folgendermaßen aus sillyhoon.com ähm, genau ja oder halt die IP die auch am Anfang des Videos und in jeder anderen Folge gezeigt wird ähm, ja genau dann äh, Link zum Video, was wir geschaut haben und wovon ihr wahrscheinlich nichts gehört habt, ist in der Beschreibung. Dann sehen wir es in der nächsten Folge und schaut doch mal auf dem Server hier vorbei. Tschüssi!